All right, so we're here today with another episode of Mason's Medicinals with Real Mushrooms. And we're talking with Dr. Robert Silver today. And Dr. Robert Silver, hello, nice to have you here, is a holistic integrative veterinarian and he has been working in the field for quite some time. And we are gonna dive into it today. We're gonna talk about all things related to pets, health, medicinal mushrooms, and really get an inside look at the pet world and how to improve the wellness of pets and different strategies to take. So welcome, Dr. Dr. Silver. Thank you. Mason. Happy to be here today. Looking forward to chatting with you about all these things. Awesome. Thanks for being here. And to start, why don't you give us a brief background into what you do, and then I'll ask you some follow-up questions from there, okay? Okay. Well, my job description has changed in the last 10 years since I have pretty much retired from clinical practice in order to work in teaching veterinarians about integrative medicine and working with companies, helping them to develop evidence-based products using nutraceuticals uh, for pets and working with them to create research studies, objective unbiased research studies to support those products. So it's been a lot of fun. I was uh, trained as a veterinarian here in Colorado, primarily with small animals, but I worked with horses and exotics and a number of different species of animals. And was in practice about 32 years before I retired. So I think that's a fair amount of time to have experience with that. I, I miss it. You know, I miss that patient contact. I miss helping the animals. I, I miss talking to people, you know. Um, I mean, I talk to people, but talking to people about their pets. I'm very fond of animals. I've had a, a very strong interest in research over the years. And as I've gotten more involved in nutraceuticals and supplements for pets and looking at how those can contribute to pet health, I've realized we need more studies, real objective studies that are, you know, that aren't really, you know, directed towards promoting a product, but promote a process. And the funding for those products, for those that study, for study of products, especially proprietary products, oftentimes is not there except through companies. And so it's a balance to try to create studies that are being funded by a company that wants the study to show their products worthwhile so people will buy it. At the same time, creating, you know, an objective study that's unbiased and, you know, letting the chips fall where they may with the results. And of course, you try to design those so that you don't have, so you have a positive outcome without fudging the results. As a um, product of the 60s, I grew up with an appreciation of the value of cannabis in many regards and uh, found myself surprised and pleased when we started to see legislation passing here in the U.S. state by state and in Canada federally legalizing the use of cannabis for medicinal and for, shall we say, adult use purposes. I think it's good. I, I don't think it's as dangerous as they've made it sound to be over the years stigmatizing it. I think it has issues. I, don't, I think it's a strong, a strong plan and needs to be used responsibly. You know? But it's been a real passion for me because it's, it's kind of the interface of, of, my, of my own personal life and preferences and my, my professional interests in plants. I'm an herbalist and the science that underlies the plants. And this is an amazing plant. So I've taken, there's a few, few living creatures out there, uh, plant-wise and, and fung, fungus-wise, that I find very fascinating. And my fascination for uh, mushrooms, and I know this is a real mushroom sort of a podcast here, that I find that mushrooms equally complex in the number of ingredients they contain and the multiple ways that it can affect biological systems in a positive way. Graduated. Colorado State University in 1982 with my veterinary degree and was in practice about 30 years before I retired from practice to continue to work. Currently providing postgraduate education to veterinarians for continuing education credit both here and in Canada on integrative medicine topics about, for instance, my next topic is going to be integrative approaches to chronic kidney disease and talking about herbal and vitamin D and a variety of different approaches to supporting the kidneys when they're not working so well or supporting them in their health so they continue to work well. My topic just before was on integrative oncology the same way, looking at 
the cancer patient from a team approach, you know, not just in terms of alternative therapies, but looking at supporting, you know, the quality of life, which I think is really at the, at the heart of integrative oncology. So I'm having fun with that and I'm having fun playing around making some products, not just cannabis products, a lot of different sorts of things. So here I am. Awesome. Well, we're really happy to have you here. And yeah, it sounds like you got an awesome blend of the academic side and then your, your previous experience in the field with all the animals and all the, the, owner, the pet owners and whatnot. So yeah, it sounds like you have a, a really nice synergy of knowledge that you're applying in your, your, your career now. What made you want to work with animals or was that something you always knew you wanted to do or was there a time in your life that there was a shift for you or take me through that? Well, I don't know. I've just always resonated with animals personally. My presence today, notwithstanding, I've always been a bit of a shy person when it comes to social interactions and animals were always a safe haven. You know, they wouldn't reject you. They wouldn't criticize you. They wouldn't stomp on you, except a few. So I really did really do love them. But that's, you know, when you when you apply for veterinary school, you don't want to use that as your reason. You want to say, oh, I really want to help the animal kingdom or I'm interested in doing research or stuff. But I love the guys, you know. As I become a veterinarian and work in the field, I've come to understand the important relationship that animals have with their guardians, with their human uh, companions. And so I also see my work in helping to keep animals healthy as a way of, of helping their human guardians have better quality of life and happiness. But I also see animals as an example, as the ability to, to teach their human guardians lessons about their own health and their own lives. You know, I mean, when you have an animal that comes in that's morbidly obese and you have an owner who looks like their pet or vice versa, you know, it's a delicate, it's a delicate dance you have to do in trying to be helpful and communicating to help the animal and maybe because you're going to have to change lifestyle in a situation like that you know food is the equivalent of love in that situation food goes to the animal they get overweight they have many many disease risks as a result same people eat oftentimes as a way of kind of protecting themselves or feeding their 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 emotional emptiness so it's it's uh, it was an, it's interesting when you get to that interface you know, the human animal bond and how that influences health on both sides of that pair, you know? Yeah, that's so fascinating. I find that animals and humans, yeah, they, they're so rich in their somatic sense and how they show up for people. And I've been really, I was talking to my partner about this the other day on how I think animals, especially right now, are doing a lot of work for people in the pandemic times and the uh, shutdowns with people in terms of social interaction and stuff and I feel like yeah that piece is so so well developed and I think animals but yeah the opposite could be the true as well as you're saying we you know were we surprised to see that in the COVID shutdowns that people started adopting more pets veterinary practices are busier than ever now even though people can't go in with their pets they they drop them off curbside and then they talk on the phone to the vet. I think that's a strong testament to the value of companionship that our, our pets give us. Such a beautiful connection that humans it and is. animals have and all living beings. Well, thank you for sharing your background and your story and why you're so connected to animals and the field. Talking a bit more through the health and wellness of animals, what do you find are the, say, you don't have to do five, but the top things that you always look for or work with with people when they're trying to influence a better health and wellness strategy for their pets. Well, as much as you and I are both, you know, excited about all these tools we have, these herbs, these mushrooms, these these procedures, you know, that are integrative and holistic, because I'm sure you're that's what you're doing too, as a naturopathic physician, it's really the basic stuff that's most important. Lifestyle, you know. The things that you do regularly, every day, day in, day out, that maybe you're making a little, doing a little something that contributes to, the, to a disease. And with lifestyle, the same thing that you're doing every day is diet, is what you're eating. Not so much if there is one perfect diet, 
but that the diet needs to reflect the needs of the individual, whether it be the animal or the person, and not just the ideal diet, but what's practical. What can they really do every day? You know, I mean, there's a lot of people want to fix food for their pets, but then they find that, which is going to be the best diet if you do it right, or it's going to be the worst diet if you do it wrong. You know, they get tired because many of these diets are so complicated, all the things you have to add. And so they start leaving stuff out. Next thing you know, you know, a year later, it looks nothing like what they started. So you have to find solutions as a practitioner. I did, and I'm sure you do, that work. Not just that are the right solution, ideally in an, in an ideal world, but that your patient or your client can make happen on a day-to-day -day basis and enriches their life versus taking away from it. That's not always easy. That's sometimes where, even though you know that commercial pet food can be kind of processed crap, sometimes it's the simplest way to go, and adding supplements on top of that can be a solution. So you know each. Each family, each household has its own solutions that you have to find for them. Yeah, that compliance factor is such such an important thing that I take into account. Oh, yeah, it's everything. If it don't get done, don't get done. Yeah. So when I think of lifestyle for myself or for my patients in my field, you know, I think of diet. I think of perhaps exercise. I think of perhaps you know some sort of stress reduction activities to take part in mostly every day or at least a couple times a week. What are some other things other than diet, I guess, and getting appropriate movement that pets need in their life? We talked about the love part, so I guess I guess they need some love, but is there anything else that comes to mind? Well, lifestyle's a big heading, you know, so it includes exercise, you know, walking with your dog is very good, whether, whether it's on a leash or not. But I think something that some people believe that animals can read your mind, which they can't really, but they can they can learn a lot from your behavior and your movements and from your facial expressions. They're very sensitive. Dogs are bright. They're really bright. Some brighter than others, but they're, they're not dumb animals by any stretch of the imagination. They are incredibly adaptive, incredibly opportunistic, and they, they're there. They understand language. I'm not, I read some study. I'm, I can't forget how many words dogs actually know. Maybe not intellectually like Webster's Dictionary, but they know what they mean. I think that the first thing that you should do with your animal, if you have, if it's if it's possible, and it may be a much older rescue animal, this may not be as possible, but it may already have had that done, is what they call training, obedience training. Really, what it is, a lot of people think of it as kind of oppressive. You're making them do what you want them to do, but it's not. What you're really doing is you're establishing a language of communication between you and the animal. And in the big picture, it really is for the animal's safety. I mean, this, is, this seems that this has nothing to do with supplements, nothing to do with, but it really is crucial because you're, you're, you're also like, what if your animal wants to go run across the street, chase a cat, and you've trained it so it listens to you. When you say stop, it stops. But what if it, you haven't trained it, crosses the street, gets hit by a car? So lack of training can be hazardous to the health. It can cause diseases as, as much as other things can. So I think that's a really important thing, and it's something that should be done from the very first day of acquisition of a new animal in your household. I think that's very important. We kind of do it with babies, you know, sort of. I wouldn't really call it training, but we develop language, and we tell them, no, you don't put your hand on the hot, on the hot stove. And, those sorts of things, the same sort of stuff. And that people sometimes think dogs know that intuitively and they just don't. You know, that I think is probably one of the more important things. Diet, of course, is, you know, is huge. But I think that's very important because it also establishes that bond. They start listening to you. They, they, and dogs want to listen. They want to learn. They want to be obedient, so to speak, because that's kind of their pack mentality. You're the pack leader, you know, when you adopt when you adopt that dog into your household. I think that, I mean, what you said, exercise, diet, of course, I guess we could have them do yoga with us, you know, downward facing doggy or goat yoga, or all those funny things that are going on these days. I think those are important. Taking, you know, exercise, obedient, training. I think obedience has a little bit of a harsh sound to it. Training and, and food, you know, some things that are consistent. And under the food umbrella, we would put supplements for wellness things like mushrooms, things like herbs that are beneficial for immune system function or 
antiviral or whatever we might be looking at. Let's go there if you want. So I know you're expert in the world of say cannabis and CBD products and how that whole plant interacts with our systems. Tell me a little bit about how to, or how you apply cannabis in a, a dog or a cat's wellness regime. And also maybe if you want to touch on mushrooms and then maybe one herb other than cannabis that you really enjoy working with. First of all, I'm not so certain that we can really speak about cannabis in a, in a wellness sense. I think that it works better when the body is a bit out of balance and helps to keep it in balance. And in that sense, provides wellness. But I think if you take a young, perfectly healthy animal, I'm not sure it does that much to it. What we found about cannabis that is so fascinating is that these plant molecules, the CBD, the THC, terpene that are in it, and many of these, these minor cannabinoids that we're now starting to learn about, the THCV, the CBDA, the raw cannabinoids, and all of them, that they will interact with receptor systems, biochemical systems in our body, which our body already has molecules to interact with, but these molecules from the outside, from a plant that's not even an animal, can orchestrate change within our body by signaling the same system that our own endogenous molecules that our body creates do. You know, for instance, THC fits into receptors in the brain and the central nervous system that were meant to be fit into by a molecule our body creates called as a not called anandamide, which is really what is responsible for the runner's high. We used to think the endorphins and the whole opiate system did that, but it turns out it's really the endocannabinoid system, which is the system of membrane receptors in the body that does that. So when you take THC, which is much stronger than the anandamide, and most people don't take it in the small amounts that, you know, that, that might be a more biologically appropriate as with anandamide, you get a very strong reaction. And in fact, you can get it the kind of reaction with THC where if you use it every day, which I'm not saying you shouldn't, it keeps filling those receptors up so your body's own molecules can't fill them. And that's where we get tolerance because people find the more they use the THC, the less high they get. So they have to take more, stronger, whatever, you know, doesn't work that way. What you have to do is stop for a little bit. If you want to have, enjoy that get high feeling, you still get the medicinal benefits without that psychoactivity, but there's also the withdrawal. People that are regular users of THC when they stop using it will get withdrawal symptoms because the anandamide production was reduced because the THC was in there instead, kind of a negative feedback loop. So, I mean, and that's just one, I'm using the most commonly known molecule in that plant. And things in Canada are a little different than in the U.S. in terms of the law and how the products are available. In Canada, as you know, cannabis is cannabis. It could be hemp, it could be marijuana, but it's, they would call it all cannabis, and it's all regulated the same way. As you know, you can go into provincial stores and, and buy something. It usually has THC in it, might have some CBD as well. But there's no license that the Health Canada has given to veterinarians that allows companies to make products for veterinarians and allows veterinarians to use that sanctioned by the government other than to reduce harm. You don't really have the same kind of CBD hemp products available as these in the same context as we have in the U.S., but in the U.S., THC is federally illegal. So we have to go state by state. In Canada, there's the risk that you'll get a product that has more THC than you want to have in it. Dogs have shown themselves to be incredibly sensitive to the adverse neurologic side effects of THC because of all the species out there, they're the only species that they found that has a huge density of these CB1 THC receptors in your cerebellum, which is responsible for balance. So you get dogs that might eat somebody's edible off of their coffee table when they're, you know, they're a little bit loopy themselves and not watching stuff. And then the dog could have an adverse reaction, have to go straight to the animal ear. So one of the things I like to do when I'm talking to the public, as with this, is to caution them about the use of products that have more THC in it than hemp in terms of giving them to their dog a large dosage because it could cause problems. 
and many people don't know that until they find out the wrong way. So that's my that's my little spiel on cannabis. As far as other herbs that I that I like, I don't know if you can really call mushrooms an herb per se because they're not a member of the plant kingdom. But I'll call them an herb anyway. They're certainly not an animal. Well, they might, some people actually think they could be a bit animalistic. Actually, I find mushrooms to be my second most favorite substance to to use and not the not for the psychotropic aspects of it but for the health benefits i have a a webinar i give it's called medical mushrooms the next best thing after cannabis in the united states there's still kind of some places are kind of squirrely about cannabis and there was one place i was giving that talk they made me change the title because they didn't like the way that sounded but it's true i think it really is you know, maybe cannabis is the next best thing after mushrooms, but I think they're the top two in my book. And then I go to the Chinese herbs, the astragalus and the Ramani and the, the you know, the complex formulations. That's probably my next go-to place when it comes to specific herbs. I love that little physiology example of the different receptors and how, you know, you got to be careful with different things and how there are contraindications. So, Touching a bit more on the medicinal mushrooms, how yes. do you use those? Are those, again, like you said, are they more medical where you're trying to sort of override and help physiology out, or are they more preventative in the whole holistic vet world, or are they both? Well, you know, I, I try to go with the evidence because I think that's the, the best way, the, the, the most unbiased way to proceed. And there just is not enough studies in veterinary species. There really aren't enough in human species either, you know, where you measure all the effects. We do know quite a bit about the effects of mushrooms in general, in part due to the research that's been done on the most active component found in medical mushrooms, which are the beta-glucan. Now, each individual mushroom, as I'm sure you've explained many times, but each individual mushroom, in addition to the beta-glucans, has its own individual organic acids, terpenes, terpenoids, number of different molecules that give that mushroom its specific potency and a specific therapeutic direction. But they all have the beta-glucans. And so we do know from a lot of research done on beta-glucans, not just derived from mushrooms, but derived from seaweed, derived from grain, derived from yeast, the beta-glucans have a wide range of effects. And because the mushrooms contain them, the mushrooms share those many researched effects. What I'm more interested in, though, is the specifics of a given mushroom, you know, reishi with its triterpenoids, you know, the turkey tail. We have one study, and it's, it's not really that great a study, quite frankly, because it's got such a small sample size in dogs that had cancer of the spleen called hemangiosarcoma. It's a very, very aggressive cancer, and most dogs don't live six months to a year if they get it. Even if they remove the spleen, it usually has metastasized, goes to the heart and other places in the body. It's nasty. But they found when they were using a specific extract of the turkey tail mushroom called PSP that is derived from one lab in China, that they were able to get survival times. They weren't able to cure them but survival times was the best they could report. And better survival times in these dogs that got the mushrooms than that had chemotherapy. That was impressive. That got everybody's attention. Now the consumers in the U.S. and probably the pet owners in Canada as well are, you know, clamoring for that particular extract when their dog gets cancer of any type, although the study was only for hemangiosarcoma. And the company is trying to get that extract patented. They're trying to get it approved by the FDA, and it's quite expensive. I mean, it's almost obscenely expensive. When you can get comparable efficacy, I believe, with high doses of the turkey tail mushroom or with blends of several mushrooms together given at high dosages in order to, because cancer needs a pretty strong shot to, to affect it. So that's what I do. That's what I did clinically. That's my suggestion to, to pet owners and to veterinarians is to use the mushrooms and to use them in a very high dosage in order to improve the response to a cancer of any type based on this one study and a number of other studies that do show good support for using beta-glucans and mushrooms in cancer patients. There's other really good applications, and, and many of them, I think, are just waiting for someone to fund a study, you know, like with lion's mane, you know, and its effect on cognitive function, its, its effect on 
neurophysiology is is remarkable, you know, and they, they're isolating compounds in that mushroom and then putting them in petri dishes with, you know, cell cultures of, of nerves and watching what they do. I think that's really good. So I, there's a lot of potential, you know, with mushrooms. A lot of people think immune, they think cancer, but there's, there's other applications as well. Reishi, I read about Reishi a lot and it's, you know, it's called Reishi, it's Ganoderma lucidum, but Reishi it means the emperor's mushroom. It's the, the imperial mushroom, and it promotes longevity. And, and the, you know, the story is that you know, the, when the emperors in China, they would always be given the, the most prized Ganoderma mushroom to be found in all of China. There's also like this story about how the Ganoderma actually elevates your spirit. And it wasn't until I tried the Real Mushrooms product, which is a real mushroom, unlike many products out there. We can get into that if you want. And I tried it at a really high dose. It's several grams, you know, at a time on an empty stomach that I, I felt the effect of it on my being. You know, I felt this calmness. I felt like I was kind of being spiritually elevated. Now, when I tried that again and again and again over time, that kind of goes away. You know, it's like that first exposure to what I call it the green effect. You know, when you oftentimes when you try a new herb for the first time, you get a real effect from it. But as you keep using it, you don't notice that effect so much. I think you know the the easy the easy application is immune. It's well studied and researched and legitimate. But I think we are just coming into a whole new realm of understanding about all the other applications of that mushrooms can provide. Yeah, all of those different compounds, some of them you mentioned there. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see how those line up and show us more things about the immune system and other systems. I just had a quick question, uh, Dr. Silver. What, what would constitute a high dose or a range of high dose per turkey tail in your, your veterinarian practice? Or what would that look like in terms of a Grams or I use the raw the same raw materials that are in the real mushroom products from Canadian supplier that are grown USDA certified organic in China. So I took those raw materials and I made my own mushroom blend for veterinary use. And I chose five mushrooms, two of which are prized edible mushrooms, the shiitake and oyster mushroom and blended that in with smaller amounts of the reishi, because with pet things, they need to be very palatable. And reishi is very powerful, but very bitter. Not all dogs like bitter, you know. And then I had a large, larger amount of turkey tail and, and cordyceps. And then I added a couple of Chinese herbs to that. I found, I did a study several years ago with beta-glucans from yeast and found that when I added astragalus root extract and licorice root extract, that I was able to increase the phagocytic capacity of neutrophils that are already being stimulated by the beta-glucans in the yeast, but were even better with the Chinese herbs. So we added those to the mushrooms as well. And then we, we assayed it for its beta-glucan content because there are established published dosages for beta-glucans. And that's, you know, when you're using a blend of multiple mushrooms, how are you going to figure out how to dose it? That was a good question, obviously. So I used the beta-glucan content, which came out to be about 35% in this, in this powder blend, which was highly palatable, and, and then dosed it that way. And based on a beta-glucan expert who's in Kentucky, he's got many, many publications in beta-glucans, you know, he has developed some dosing that works. He's done some studies in laboratory animals using different dosages. He found in one study that he did in mice, he used beta-glucans, he compared the effect of beta-glucans from yeast, from mushrooms, from seaweed on different types of experimentally induced cancers in mice. And then he measured the weight of the tumors as they grew, influenced by each of the different beta-glucan compounds at different dosages. And so he found that about at about 25 to 30 mg per kg of beta-glucans, he was able to get the best inhibition of growth for these aggressive cancers. But for most things, he was using dosages of about 5 to 10 mg per kg. So that's how I established my label dosing for that is based in that. And it may be you're giving them a lot of mushrooms to get that much beta-glucan. 40 to 35% is a pretty good assay. And, and most of the mushrooms that you can get from 
real mushrooms are in that zone, 25 to 35 or 40 percent. I think there's one that's even 50 percent I, I read recently. So that's how I dose it. And I, I always try to dose things intelligently, numerically, based on the weight of the animal. I think that's the most repeatable way of doing it and the most professional way, of course. Thanks for going through that. That's that's really helpful. Actually, just to, complicated, yeah. But I like the backstory and I like the milligram per kilogram. It makes a lot of sense if you're trying to just do something. Effective. You gotta. We're yeah. doctors, you know. You gotta walk the talk. Yeah, yeah. The precision. It's nice. It's good. Yeah. So thanks for going through that. You mentioned something about the reishi and its bitterness. Do you find any tricks, or do you have any tricks on improving the overall? compliance with the taste in animals? Do you find mixing it with food or that, like you said, the different things? Capsules. That's the best. And they can still get a little bit of that bitterness through the capsule. So taking the capsule and blending it in with some food, maybe a, you know, some canned, something that, that they would kill for. Canned, canned cat food is probably the, the, uh, the, the gold standard, for the, the holy grail for dogs. <laughs> Cats are another challenge, and I'm not sure you're going to be able to get reishi in a cat, but it's worth a try. You'd have to do, I think you would have to really like take the reishi and then encapsulate it like in, like in these little Chinese tea pills where they encapsulate them and they surround them with this hard kind of a coat shell. I've been working with a new product technology called beadlets, where we actually surround the powder with a fatty material like a glycerol stearate or something along those lines, which protects the taste and flavor and would get them in there. But I don't think you could get reishi in an animal voluntarily without trying hard and maybe winding up shredding your skin if it's a cat. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. So just hide it in some tasty, some tasty food, okay? And go with the capsule, you know, and, and that's, that's a nice thing about, and not meaning to promote the product too much, but I, I really like the line, the, the real mushroom line. That's what's so nice because they come both as powders and as capsules. And so it gives you a choice as far as if you're using that for a pet to do that. And um, my own family, we use uh, real mushrooms. We take them daily, all of us in the household, because they are so good and such high quality. I guess we could probably take my own product and mix that with our food, but I like it in capsules. It's quicker. Who else is in your home there? Do you have any pets currently? I'm sure you've got a few, or do you have, you have pets? Just lost my 21-year-old cat. He died in his sleep from old age. Sad, but it was a nice way to go. As a veterinarian, you know, most of my career, I get those animals that, that are in crisis, and I have to put them to sleep, which is not a, not a pleasant process, but I understand I'm relieving, I'm relieving suffering when I do that. And so I, I really didn't have a lot of experience seeing animals die on their own and yet my last two cats i had another cat that died at 19 same thing died in his sleep it's nice i i, I like that it's but i didn't want to have to make that decision and i wouldn't have done it myself i would have had a vet come in here to do that we have two dogs actually three dogs because my mother-in-law lives with us as well she's got a big standard poodle that's unruly and she's just a little you know, 78-year-old woman. I've got a, uh, a Labrador, Ollie, and he's, a, he's cute as can be. And he's, um, he's a chow hound. And a little bit, he was a rescue dog. So he had this sort of emotional thing coming in. And with Labs, food, again, is the holy grail. So I'm bad. I give him more treats than probably I should for his weight. He's not an ideal weight anymore. He's a little chunkster. You know, it's a trade-off. You want to have him, you know, live his whole life, you know, being lean and thin and a little bit timid or, you know, a little bit of a treat here and there kind of makes makes life good. And then uh, my wife's dog, Violet, she's a, a, a German uh, wired hair pointer. I've got a 16-year-old daughter who's in high school, virtual these days, and my wife and her mom, we all live in the same place. Of course, with COVID now, it's pretty much cabin fever all the time. Right. And you're in Boulder, mm -hmm. right? I am outside of Boulder. Yep. Outside of Boulder. Mm -hmm. I've heard it's nice. I've never visited, but I'm sure it's got some good nature and outdoors out there. It's lovely. We've got some, a little bit of property. Our neighbor has a bunch of horses and a mule, and we have bear and fox and raccoons and owls and golden and bald eagles in the area so yeah it's quite nice yeah. too many people but it's a nice area <laughs> well this has been really really great to go through a couple topics with you 
how can people find you? You have a website, the wet or the wellpetdispensary.com, right? I do have an e-commerce site that I work out of my home where we sell supplements for pets. I'm available to give a little bit of advice. You know, I try not, I can't really doctor that way, but I give some, you know, some generic advice that is helpful. That's wellpetdispensary.com, as you mentioned. I also have a blog site and I started it alone, but I now have two vets who have joined me and it's called nurseyourpet.com. And I have an equine, a, a holistic equine vet who blogs with us, Joyce Harmon. She's in Virginia. And I have a, a rehab specialist, veterinarian who's been board certified in veterinary rehab, which is what we call physical therapy. And so the three of us blog, we've got, we're starting to add some videos to it and kind of upgrading the, the media experience there with that blog. I think those are probably the, my two best sources. I've written a book, Medical Marijuana and Your Pet, that I sell on that website in ebook and, and softbound fashion. Those are ways that people can get a hold of me if they're interested. We'll link those in when this becomes active for the viewers and the listeners. So they can okay. log out and learn more about you. 